Pastor Art's still gone. I figure we use our extra time to get this sermon in before 9 o'clock. Yeah. Hopefully when you got to come in, you got an outline tonight. You should have an outline that says the things we must know. The things we must know, part one. The things we must know, part one. If you didn't get an outline, if you'll raise your hand, one of the guys or gals will get you one. Anybody need an outline? If you hadn't got to be here with us on Wednesday nights, we're, we're working verse by verse through the book of Romans. We found ourselves right in the very middle of the book of Romans, uh, Romans chapter 5. And we're going to be looking, uh, breezing over, as it were, verses 12 through 21. The reason your outline says part 1 on it is I don't know how many parts there will actually be for, to us getting through this, this section in this, in this chapter. What we're going to do tonight is kind of run over some broad concepts, some big things, that jump out so that you see what's kind of going on here. And then what we're going to do, Lord willing, is we're going to back back up next Wednesday night, back to verse 12, and we're going to really start breaking it down and looking at it in, in a whole lot more detail. But it is one of those parts of uh, the Scripture, it's one of those parts of the book of Romans that is, um, uh, that is very, very deep. There on, the, on your outline, if you look down, down there towards the bottom of the page, um, it says these verses bring up amazing and deep truth. So, as one old preacher put it, when he was working through here, he brought everybody in the church's attention to First Peter one, uh, verse thirteen, where the Lord said, "Gird up the loins of your mind," and that's what you're going to have to do tonight. Um, we're going to go until we get tired. I don't know if we'll get to the end, but uh, any part in here, we could we can settle down and stay not just for a sermon or two. These are, these, there are some very big things here, and they are things we need to know as we're going to grow in the Lord. So let's pray together, and uh, let's jump right into it. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. Thank you, Lord, for everybody's here. We pray, Lord, for those of our number that are on uh, beds of affliction, those in the hospital, those that are grieving, those in difficulties, those that are off working right now. We just pray, Lord, that you'd watch over and keep them and bless us here as we gather together tonight. Lord, help us to break open your word. Help us to consider it. We pray, Lord, that you'd grow us. And, Lord, we pray for the grace to be able to present your word in a way that would glorify your son. Lord, if there's anybody here tonight that doesn't know you as their Savior, we pray they'd hear your call. And, Lord, we pray that they'd come quickly. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, there at the top of your page, there are things every Christian... There are three things in this chapter that every Christian knows, if they know Romans 5 at all. If you've studied through this, the first part of it, we've been through in detail. But there will be three things that you will absolutely know for sure uh, if, if, you, if the Spirit of God leads you through any kind of understanding of Romans 5 at all. And that is, number one, that God lifted us. You're going to know that God lifted us. God changed our situation. We saw that in great detail in verses 1 through 5. We've spent the last few weeks looking at the fact that God loves us. We know that God lifted us, and we know that God loves us, and what we're going to see in verses 12 through 21 is that God has loosed us. God has set us free from something that held us um, uh, in death, but God has given us a gift in grace that has led us to life, okay? Okay. And, the, and basically what we're going to see here in verses 12 through 21 is, is this reality of how God uh, in particular has, has, has given us freedom from the curse of sin and allows us to walk in the justification uh, that, that, he, that he, he has purchased for us with his blood and that we inherit eternal life from the fact that God has declared us just and we are in Christ. If, you, if you've basically been here for the last few weeks and you got that say I got it so the verses say this therefore just as through one man sin entered the world who is that that's Adam and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. for until the law 
sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there was no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even after those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who's a type of him who was to come. Just like in, in Adam, Adam had this capacity through his sin that death came to the world. Christ in his life is going to bring life to the world. Okay? That's the, that's the one who is to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. There's, they're, they're, they, they both have a head. Adam was the head of sin. Christ is the head of life. But the offense is not, the free gift, salvation, is not like the offense, which was rebellion that led to the reign of sin in mankind. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. Okay, the, the, uh, the gift isn't like that. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. So he's, what he's saying is one sin brought offense, but even though there's been many sins since Adam's first sin, right, Christ, Christ from the many offenses still brings us into justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift or the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as it by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience will many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered, that the offense might abound, basically increase. But where sin abounded, grace, grace abounded much more. Amen? Amen. That's true of all of our lives. So that sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, we read through that, and we, again, like I've already said, we read, just read through one of the greatest passages and teaching in all the Bible, in fact, many theologians, and I'm not much of a theologian, but I agree with them when I think that this is basically almost its own separate section within the book of Romans because here Paul backs up and everything he's been talking about from chapter 1 all the way to this point, he kind of backs up and takes a big panoramic view of it. He takes us all the way back in history to Adam. He brings us all the way up to and through Jesus Christ and he shows what Christ um, has done in the world. What I want you to do with me tonight is to look at some, at some big things, some real, some very big concepts. I don't know if we'll get through all of them. So what I want to do is to give you numbers 1 through 6 there on your outline, and then we're going to go back and we'll talk about some of them in detail, okay? And uh, when it gets to be 8 o'clock, I want somebody to blow a whistle, okay? Because I don't know where we'll be at. Now, don't blow a whistle. Just do, you'll scare me if you blow a whistle, so wave at me. So, number one, one of the first things that we see is, and we must know is that God is my creator. God is my creator. If you got it, say, I got it. Flip your page over. Number two, God is my condemner. God has not only not only sets as the judge, but he also pronounces sentence upon sin. Death did not come from the devil. Death is the penalty of sin against God. God declared to Adam, the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. And when he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, spiritually he died. Then later, physically, he died. But, the, but he brought in a, a reality. And the one who set that condemnation is none other than God himself, okay? We, you can't escape that. That is a reality. God sets a righteous judge. Number three, God is my covering. God is my covering. Even though we are, we are in our sin, Christ covers us. He's our propitiation. He's our meeting place. He atones for us. You got that? What are those three things? God is my... Say it with me. God is my 
Number one, God is my. Number two, God is my. And number three, God is my covering. Mimi, did you say covering on number two? You did. Francis says you did. So let's do it again. Number one, God is my. Number two, God is my. Condemner. Number three, God is my. Covering. Number four, God gives freely. It's a gift. Amen. Number five, God gives fully to all men. And number six, God gives forever. So what's four, five, and six? God gives freely, God gives fully, and number six, God gives forever. Because number one, God is my what? My creator. Number two, he's my what? Number four, God gives Okay, just thought I'd mess you up for a minute. All right. You want to make sure you're with it. Now, flip your page back over. Let's get down into the details of what we're talking about. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, would we say to ourselves, this is Adam, we would be right if we said that because verse 14 calls him by name. And he talks about the fact that from Adam to Moses, and what is, what is in particular here about Moses? From Adam to Moses. What happened at Moses with the law? That's what he's talking about there. Until Moses, till God gave Moses the law, sin reigned in death all the way from Adam to Moses. Once we get to the law, it's very plain that mankind is guilty. But that's not really where the story starts. The story starts with a reality that we either believe or we reject. And that is this, that God is our creator. A lot of reality is going to be spoken of here by the Apostle Paul as something that had happened in Adam, the first man, being carried down all the way to us in Scurry, Texas tonight in this room. There are, there are fundamental reasons why we do not reject the Word of God for the, for, for the sake of fitting into what the world might call logical or even scientific. No, no the Bible's not a science book. But when it talks about science, it's accurate. Okay, And without going into a lot of long and lengthy talking about guys, there is a whole lot more evidence than, than the world would have you think scientifically that the world is much younger than what the world thinks, people talk about, and even today many preachers assume. Even there's many great and famous preachers that had this view that there was a pre-Adamite world that God had created, and he didn't necessarily, he kind of recreated between verses 1 of Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. That that's where the dinosaurs lived, and that's where there were cavemen, and God wiped all them out, and God started over with, with a guy named Adam. And they, they, they come up with that belief so that they can, they sound like they agree with things on a scientific level. Uh, the only real thing nowadays scientifically that's holding anything to this very old age of everything that's going on that gets talked about is radiocarbon dating. There are a great many scientists that don't believe anything about it. They don't come out and say anything about it because they lose a lot of their funding. But um, I've heard people say, well, the world has to be this old for, uh, you know, has to, the universe has to be that old for the light from the sun, from the stars to be here where we can see it. Well, that'd be well and good unless God wanted us to see them. And if God wants us to see the star so that, we can, so that we can get an idea of how vast he is and how wide he is, then he's not subject to, he's not subject to time. Are y'all following what I'm saying? God wants you to see the light from a star billions and billions and billions of universes away. That's what God will do if that's what God is in the mood, if for lack of a better term, to do. Okay? Lots of things you'll get heard and said, I was taught all my life about how old the Grand Canyon is, and they could tell by the sediments of the rock and that kind of thing. The funny thing is there's a small canyon that was made 
uh, uh, when Mount St. Helens erupted and when they radiocarbon date it and check it and test it and all that, it, it shows to be billions of years old. But I was alive when that happened. It was 1980. I was alive when that, when that canyon got formed, you know. And so there's, again, without just going into a whole lot of detail on it, and, and the reality is this. Like with all things with the Word of God, ultimately you believe or not. If a person won't believe, all the proof in the world won't make them believe. You know, if you say, there is a whole lot more credible evidence that Jesus Christ lived than Julius Caesar lived, most people will scoff at you. But the reality is, if you're intellectually honest, you have to say amen to what I just said, because it's the truth. It's just not talked about. It's not talked about because the skeptic is not going to believe no matter what. And a person who is going to believe Somebody asked me one time, is the, is the Shroud of Turin legitimate? I said, I don't know. Reality is, it don't really matter. I know Christ rose from the grave when he called my heart, spoke to me in the Word. I don't need a shroud to prove it. And anybody that needs a shroud, well, they'll deny it. They'll come up with seven different ways of that shroud showing up. And you know what I'm saying. Y'all follow where I'm at? Okay. So, but it's like people will say, oh, Jesus really wasn't virgin born. They said, well, some of the scriptures that just really, the way they should translate it was just that she was a young woman. Now, there's a devil behind that trying to get you to twist the word of God around so that you don't believe it fully. Why? Why? Because if, if Jesus wasn't born of a virgin, he was born under what we've just read about here, and that's called original sin. So when he died on the cross, he really wasn't a sinless sacrifice, was he? If he wasn't born of a virgin. If Adam did not really live, then there is no sin that has been translated from Adam to us. The reason the evolutionist wants to throw off the Lord for, for just for sake of saying it this way, throw out any idea of intelligent design is because there is a fundamental lie that Satan himself wants you to hold to. If mankind was not created by God, if mankind is not morally responsible to our Creator, then we have no guilt. That's the agenda. There on the bottom of your outline, I put it this way. Adam was real. His sin was real. And the results of his sin are real. If the evolutionist is correct, then they can, they can effectively remove mankind's guilt. If I am an accident, if I am no more than the natural occurrence of natural selection and random mutation, if that's all I am, then morality, right and wrong, has nothing to do with me surviving. Now, the way, of course, the evolutionists promote it now is that, well, that is an evolutionary social process that has occurred so that we can all live and get along. But why do we need to give along? Is it not survival of the fittest? Is it not easier to survive by not having morals? Is it not easier for me to survive to take from you or to go to work every day? You see it? The, the agenda behind it and the reason it's so adamant 
that there is no creator and you're a fool if you believe that the earth is not really uh, billions of years old. If you think there was really somebody named Adam, you are just a joke. And even in Christian circles, we take and, and, we, and we've turned the first 11 chapters of Genesis into a myth so that we can fit in with the rest of the world. But guys, here's the thing. If we throw off the reality of Adam, we throw off the reality that we're guilty. And mankind doesn't want to be guilty. When mankind in his false ideology realizes he can't save himself, he comes up to the conclusion, I don't need saving. I've seen that on bumper stickers. I don't need saving. And if somebody is truly, truly uh, in, in belief of heart, believes they are an accident, if they're intellectually honest to what they say they think, then they don't have any concept of needing saving. They don't think they're sinners in the least. And if we are just evolved, if there was no Adam, then morality is a waste of time. But you will not hear one evolutionist get on the side of Hitler. There's not one science, and all he was was a social Darwinist. He did not believe mankind was equal. The Word of God says man is of one blood. Everything he did, he did in the survival of his, what he considered his species. You ever studied it? All they was about was living space living space for who he considered and they considered to be superior. But you will never hear an evolutionist say, oh, there's a difference in people. Why? Because one, there is no difference in people. We are born of one blood. But that is a Christian concept. From a truly, quote-unquote, scientific evolutionary standpoint everything they say they believe about people is really a lie if they really hold to evolution and everything they say about society is a lie are y'all following me i know we're kind of way out there tonight but when the word of god says in the beginning god created as Christians, our first duty ought to be, Lord, I believe you. I want to grow in that belief. I want to have reasonable trust. All over the world, it is wrong to steal. We've already read in Romans that God wrote the law in men's heart when they did not have the law until Moses came. Are y'all following me? Why? Because God is letting mankind know I am your creator and you and me are connected and you are morally responsible to me because I'm God. Even in this room, I'll guarantee you there were people that did not like the fact that I said God is my condemner. Well, who's God think he is? Well, God thinks he's God. And God thinks you were created in his image and in, your, in his likeness. And God thinks in that image and in his likeness, mankind fell into sin and mankind took on his own likeness. And mankind needs to be redeemed or mankind is going to be separated from his God. And there's only life in God. And God loves you too much to just let you perish. The evolutionist just wants you to live for a little while. Denying your eternity, which none of us in this room, even if we're lost, can really do. The hypocrisy of it is so deep. Half those atheists that we elect as, as congressmen standing on the steps of the Congress building on 9-11 singing, God bless America. What a farce. What a group of liars. And then they don't want me to follow them. They're not even intellectually honest. For the life of me, I don't know why half these presidents put their hand on a Bible. They don't believe it. My God, Donald Trump had three different groups of three different religions up there praying on Inauguration Day. What a farce. Show me your belief. Don't show me you want to fit in with everybody so you get another set of votes. 
My God, why in the world did Obama have his hand on a Bible? You don't believe it? You laugh at the first 11 chapters of it, but you'll put your hand on it and say you'll swear before God, do the best you can. I just like to see somebody that's intellectually honest. I like to see somebody that really believes in evolution stand up and say, I believe people ought to be divided up in species. You'll never see it. Are y'all following what I'm saying? You'll never see it. Why is it supposedly scientifically it all goes that way, but man's all of one blood? Baby, that's from here. It's God's word that says we're equal. It's God's word that says we're the same. Is that making sense? The world today wants to pick and choose between what is convenient and what's politically acceptable to it. Why should I not steal? Why in the world does somebody got to go to jail for stealing from somebody else when all they're trying to do is get a, get a buy a little bit better on in this world? Because man's got it written in his heart, thou shalt not steal. All over this world, go grab somebody's wife and run off with them. See what happens to you. See if you don't get a mad brother chasing you. He can get his hands on you, he'll kill you. Why? Why? Why the, why the Indian in South America? Why the guy over there in the Congo jungle? Why the guy walking down the street in America? Why, guys? Because it's in us. It's not accidental. The devil wants you to hold to the fact, oh, there wasn't no real Adam. Because he wants you believing you're not guilty. God only saves one kind of person. You know who it is, right? Lost sinners. You don't ever come to the place where you recognize you're lost. You will never call out for salvation. Why should you call out for something you don't think you need? Are y'all following me? See how deep that runs? You understand, we're just scratching it. We're just scratching it. There's not a strong, great biblical truth that Satan does not have a corruption of. Satan would have you and the world would have you scoff and laugh at the idea that sin entered into this world through a man who had been created by God and had direct command from God. That's why sin comes to us from, through Adam and not through Eve. Eve took first, right? But in Adam all die. And it's not just because God, it's not because God's a male chauvinist. It's because Adam had direct word from God. We'll talk about that in just a second. Number two. In verse 12, it says. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men. That is as big a statement as you will ever hear about the reality of the sin nature of mankind. In fact, what we have read in verses 12 through 21 is the Bible's most exhaustive declaration on what we call original sin. Write that out somewhere off to the side. The words original sin. Sin, that is the sin nature that you and I were born with. Consider there on your outline, in Genesis 1, 26 through 27, look closely at the words. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let him have dominion. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. If you look closely at your scriptures, you know that it's not until chapter 2 that God describes and gives to us how Eve came into being. Here we see the declaration and idea of God that male and female 
they would be absolutely perfected and they would be in the image of who? In the image of who? Do you see how it says, let us make man in our image? That is the one God speaking within the Godhead. God is singular and plural. And that word us is properly translated. Have you ever heard the the word for God, Elohim? Elohim is the plural form of the word God, the name of God, El. Elohim, the plurality of the singular God. Here is the Father, Son, and Spirit making this statement. Let us make man in our image. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. So God created mankind, male and female, in his image. Male and female, he created them, not he evolved them. Called out of nothing. The word there for created means just that came from nothing you say I created this work of art no you didn't you had a pencil you had a paper you have some paint you had a brush you saw something you had a memory you had an idea you had a con there was something for you to work with God called it out of nothing that's creation and that's where mankind was come from and you are either created or you are evolved it is on purpose or it is on accident Herein is the great dilemma the evolutionist has painted himself into. The the proverbial corner, so to speak, that he's painted himself into. And the reason they hold so tenaciously even to stuff that don't even line up scientifically is because if it wasn't by accident, then it had to be on purpose. And if it was done on purpose, it was done by somebody. And if it was done by somebody, are we connected to that somebody? Can that somebody lay claim on us? And that's why they hold so tenaciously to it being an accident. Now, look at chapter 5, verse 3. And Adam lived 130 years, and he begot a son in his own likeness, after his image, and named him Seth. Now, he had two boys before Seth, right? Cain and Abel. He was 130 when he had him. He said, Brother Todd, they really live that long? Yeah, they live that long. He said, well, Brother Todd, it's not scientifically possible. Sure, it's scientifically possible. Mankind still don't know why mankind ages. They tell me, and I'm no scientist, but they tell me basically your aging process is the inability of your mitochondria to not excessively decay. When you leak too much, Out of the powerhouse of a cell, your mitochondria, that cell dies. They think a lot of environmental factors have things to do with it. I don't know if it's I'm just old now and everybody looks better. But I remember when I was young, in the 70s, that there was some 50-year-old men walking around that looked like they was 87. To me, I'm sure our kids, if I went back there, they'd say, Brother Todd, that's what you look like to us. But you remember how much pollution we had? Remember how many cigarettes y'all smoked? One after the other. Everybody smoked. I've been in churches where they smoked. At church, they wouldn't smoke in the sanctuary because they loved Jesus too much, so they'd step out into the foyer and smoke. Ashtrays in the foyer. <laughs> it looked rough. Remember what Pittsburgh used to look like, everybody? Huh? You wouldn't go swimming in no river around Pittsburgh. I'll give them that. At least they cleaned it up a little bit. Before the flood, we have record of people living this great amount of time. We also have evidence, archaeological evidence, that the world's climate was different. That animals would grow to huge size, dinosaurs and whatnot. You know, Brother Todd, they wasn't around then. Yes, they was. Job talks about two of them. 
Glen Rose, Texas, they got footprints of people beside, beside footprints of dinosaurs. Somebody told me one time it's because they said it was just still muddy. I thought, well, that's a pretty good deal. A footprint holding up in the mud for a, a billion years till a dude showed up. That's a pretty muddy spot. Most of the mud I run around, a track will hold for a little bit, and then it gets a little bit more muddy, and then the track goes away. So, Brother Todd, they told me in school that the dinosaurs will come to all that we drive in in our cars. What? They said, well, they sunk down in the dirt, Brother Todd, and, uh, and, they, and they rotted, and when they rotted, it turned into all. Really? I've seen some dead cows laying out in the pasture. Got hit by lightning one time. And, Danny, I watched the buzzards eat them. Remember that time we went deer hunting over at your place? Remember that guy's bull died back there behind our cabin? Remember how it stunk? He didn't turn into oil, Danny. The bull didn't turn into oil and seep down into the ground, down into the deep layers of the rock. He said, Brother Todd, you're just being silly because it was his bones. I thought his bones turned into stone and we call them fossils. And by, that, by, by the way, how many bones does it take to make all the oil that's in the world? How many barrels do, do us and the Saudi Arabians pump out every day? Must have been a boatload of, of dinosaurs in Saudi Arabia, Danny. What? I, I, I just say, Brother Todd, you have no degree. You have no degree in geology. And I don't want one if that's what you're telling me. Remember this about a lot of academia. You get the degree because you agree with the professor. And if you disagree, you get an F. And a lot of things in this world ain't just math. Now, if your, if your math teacher flunks you because you said 2 plus 2 is 5, you just wrong. 1, 2, 3, 4. It's 4. Y'all got me? But if your philosophy teacher flunks you because you have a different philosophy than he or she has, does not necessarily mean you're wrong because they could be wrong. The scriptures put it this way, comparing themselves with themselves. They were not wise. See, truth is truth. It don't matter if your professor likes it or dislikes it. I hear them all the time say, well, just write the paper the way I want it. They, and, and, and you can believe what you want to on the outside. They get you to do that so you conform, 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 conform. You might as well be Ananias, Azariah, and Mishael. You don't know who I'm talking about, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That was, that was where Daniel and them lived. Conform, conform, conform. Daniel said, we ain't going to eat that food. Conform, con here's your new name, here's your new food. Fit in, fit in, fit in. Pass the test. Get the Ph.D. Anyway, as you can tell, this is a hot button with Brother Todd. I went to Margie's graduation. Margie got her master's degree in deaf education Saturday. I watched them walk up. People walk up, got on fancy little hats. Don't get me wrong. I paid all that money. To get some of them degrees, Danny, I'd buy me a fancy hat too. And they walk up and they step up and they put robes on them. You get robes, see, Danny. You just don't move your tassel. That's just high school and, and undergrad stuff. Danny, there's a world where people walk around and they don't have the flat mortarboard. They got on fancier hats. And they put these, they put this cape on them. Kind of like a like you're at Comic-Con. But they put this cape on you. And this other doctor, you have to have a doctor that comes up and he's kind of, her, her was your proctor, mentor, and they, they robe you. He said, well, Brother Todd, don't make fun of it. Oh, I can make fun of it when the guy got his Ph.D. and how many nuts is in peanut butter. I can make fun of it when one guy got a Ph.D. because his dissertation was, is do, do Asian athletes prefer athletic apparel made in China? That, I, I'm not making that up. That woman was there. A doctorate. 
got a doctorate degree. Ain't that the kind of doctor you want to go to? Ooh, I got problems. Look in the newspaper, in the yellow page. Here's Dr. Somebody. She got to know something. No, she got her doctorate in how many Reese's Pieces can really fit into a package. I sat there reading them things and people wrote them dissertations on and I thought, and this is intelligence in America. You remember the woman that spoke? The anesthesiologist? You remember that nonsense? Oh, my Lord. I mean, just want to just puke. This is what's being passed off for intelligence? This is what's being passed off for reality? Nonsense. But but comparing themselves with themselves, they were not wise. Now, again, hot button issue. Number two, God is my condemner. Verses 1, chapter 1, 26 and 27, guys, are before the fall into sin. Where do you think Genesis 5, 3 is? After the fall into sin. So fill in them blanks and then look real close at them words. You notice a difference? Let's read it together. God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Look at chapter 5, verse 3. Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in whose image? His. No longer has the nature of God, does he? He got shadows of it. But now he's fallen. Seth was born in the image of Adam. God, Adam was created in the image of God. It's obvious that Adam could pass this on, but it ain't what Adam passed on, is it? Adam passed on that fallen nature. And you say, Brother Todd, prove it. Well, chapter 5, guys, we just read it. In Adam all died, because in Adam there is original sin. Mankind needs saving. Y'all heard me talk about this too many times. We talking about the school today, right, Brother David? We talking about starting the the, the new day school. We're gonna start. We're gonna try to start it. I think two year olds, three year olds, and then pre K, four and five year olds. Start it in January. We're gonna run it Monday through Thursday. It's going to be a Jesus deal for kids. They're not just going to be watched. We're going to be learning their music and their scriptures and learning their little lessons. When they hit kindergarten, they're going to be, they're going to be rolling. But you always know discussing today was how many kids at a time can we realistically handle? And how many people do you have to have watching? And, of course, you've got to have at least two. But then what's the number? Can two people watch 42-year-olds? Oh, my God, no. <laughs> Lord Jesus, no. And I don't mean his name. I'm not taking his name in vain. I mean, Lord Jesus, don't ever let us do anything like that. What about three-year-olds? They get better or worse at three? I can't remember. Well, the only thing worse than two-year-olds is three-year-old, right? Why you got to watch them so close? Oh, Brother Todd, they're curious. And they just get into stuff. Amen. You know what else they'll do? They'll snatch the ears off of one of them if you ain't looking. They'll gouge the other one's eye out. I've been enjoying being a grandpa. Pap, uh, David Gilmer says, you know, we hear more about grandkids now that you're a granddaddy. Says, Amen. But I enjoy watching them. It's a study in humanity. And I'm watching, I'm watching Titus. The other day. You know, he said, you got two boys. One of them feels like being mischievous. When one, even if one does one feels like being a decent little human. And uh, Titus was playing with something. And Todd Kana comes running up. Of course, he's going to earn that red hair boy. Woo! That boy, he's something. He looks at me and grins. Full bore runs and snipes his brother from the back. Jumps on his back, pulls him down, yanking him away from whatever it was he was playing with. Looks at me and laughs. Where in the world does that come from? 
I'm going to torment this other human. Watch me enjoy myself. The kid is 14, 15, 16 months old, year and a half old. Where's that come from? Does it come from nature? It's our human fallen nature to the point that without the witness of God, we can sin do all kinds of horrible things and always have a good reason for it. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is destruction. I've often wondered what God thinks about the fact that every war that's ever been fought, each side thinks he is on their side. The Nazis were sure they had the blessing of God. What? Slaying God's people like they did. Convinced that they could replace and had replaced Israel. That Israel was under no divine providence of God. Their preachers had assured them that the Israel had been replaced. You say, Brother Todd, that's crazy. Amen, ain't it? Ain't it? The way we can sin and justify it. It's the reason once you got saved, you started a war. You got saved, you can't do the things you used to do. You can't do it and not be tore up about it. You can't do it and not deal with it. You can't think about it. You say, I used to love this. And your flesh still does, but your, but your, but your spirit is in a war. Does that make sense? Now, what happens out of that original sin that comes from that fall? Well, there's a penalty. That penalty is death. God told Adam, you can eat of everything in this garden. He was in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden was the tree of life itself. And God never told him you can't go eat of the tree of life, did he? God said, no, you leave the tree of the knowledge of good and evil alone. See, God created us in his image and in his likeness. So he gave mankind something called choice and what kind of world would it be if you could choose darkness but not know what darkness was could you could was adam really being obedient if there was no tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden if there was no place where god says do this and live no God created mankind and in his image. He didn't, he didn't create mankind to operate on instinct. Dog acts like a dog because it's a dog. We choose. God made us in his image and in his likeness. Look at what mankind did. Man had only one way to sin in the whole garden, and that's what man did. Only one way to sin, and mankind ran in active rebellion. And it brought death. Look at it there in, in the verses again. Therefore, justice through one man's sin are entered into the world, and death through sin. Why? Because God, that's the condemnation God has put on sin. Death. Why is there so much death in the world? Because the world has been the world, the, the universe has been cursed because of sin. Thus death spread to all men because all sin. For until the law. Sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed, in other words, held to an account, when there was no law. What is he saying? I would submit to you under number three, God is my covering. We see reason. We see God being more than reasonable. And we also see, and you can write this out to the side somewhere, and I don't know how long we'll spend on it, but we see the extent, write those word, these words down, extent or the extent of atonement. The extent of the covering. Adam's sin 
death reigned, verse 14, from Adam to Moses until there was a giving of the law, even over those who had not sinned like Adam had sinned. They were still sinning. They were born under sin and they sinned, but they had not sinned like Adam had. What does it mean? Without the, without the law being given, mankind was not under direct command from God. When the law came, mankind had direct command from God. There was only one man that had had that before, and his name was Adam. He had a direct word from God. Eve did not have that direct word. Adam told Eve what God had said. Eve takes the tree. She, she was not under direct command from God, but Adam was. That's what that means. Even all those, none of them had sinned like Adam had because none of them had the word of God. The Gen Genesis was written by Moses. God told Moses about what happened in the beginning. God told Moses about what happened with Cain and, and, and Abel. Y'all follow me? God told Moses about Noah. There was no word from God about it. Does that make sense? Adam, Adam broke direct command. When we break the law of God, we break direct command. You and I are not in the same dispensation as those who live from Adam to Moses. We've got the word. You know thou shalt not steal. It's in the top ten. You know you shall not. Y'all follow me? Makes sense, right? But yet, nevertheless, death reigned. But God did not impute their sin on them when they did not know, when they did not understand. They did not have a direct word. Look at verse 13 again. For until the law... Sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed. It was not added to the account when there was no law, when there was no direct command from God. Does that make sense? See how God's reasonable? Mankind wasn't under, the, wasn't under it. He doesn't, he doesn't hold them accountable to the same extent. Death reigned. He had a provision of grace in their day, but the reality is there was no law. They weren't break, they weren't, they, none of them committed the same sin Adam did until Moses, where they were in pure rebellion. That's what we see in the next line. We see rebellion. But where it says verse 14, we see rebellion. Direct disobedience. Remember when we studied this about the sacrifices? Remember, there was no sacrifice for willful sin direct disobedience when God justified us he justified us from stuff that the sacrificial system didn't even have provision for verse 13 law until the law came sin was in the world but sin isn't imputed where there is no law God does not hold guilty anybody that is not under his direct command a, a baby that never has any reason and capacity. Somebody with mental incapacity that keeps them from ever being able to hear or know. Are y'all following me? The command of God. Now they're all born under original sin. But God says he doesn't impute it. But what's happened? Now there's a covering. This verse and verses like it let us know that when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for original sin. Where there is no grasping, understanding, direct revelation from God and his word, God does not hold mankind accountable to it and has obviously covered their original sin because they're born under it. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid for original sin. I said, Brother Todd, why are you walking up on this like this? 
Because there are people in the church and in the Baptist church even that would have you believe that Jesus didn't die for everybody. They call it limited atonement. That verse of Scripture and others like it let us know that his atonement was not limited. And not just as a lot of hyper-Calvinists will say, oh, I, I'm sure the, I know that the death of Jesus Christ on the cross is sufficient. It's just that God doesn't let some of them know about it. That verse of Scripture right there lets us know the backbone, the reasoning behind when David's little baby died and he said, he said, I can't, he can't come to me, but I'll go to him. How did David know that baby was going to be in heaven? Where there is no law, sin was not imputed to them. When Christ died on the cross, that was the only thing that could have covered that baby's sin. Is that when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for original sin. We've lost babies in this church. We've lost little kids in this church. I don't get up here and wonder if they're in heaven or hell. You say, well, Brother Todd, God wouldn't send a baby to hell, but guys, if that little child is a sinner, that child has to have a covering. And praise God, Jesus died on the cross, and he's their covering. A stillborn child is still under the blood of Jesus. Or they're not in heaven, but praise God, they're under the blood. And God does not impute it where there is no law. So this tells us there's no way for the atonement of Christ to be limited. It's not limited in the least. You'd have those come up and say, well, everybody's just born that way. They was elect anyway. Died without understanding. They was just elect anyway. Boy, you are, you are, some of you Calvinists is pulling at the straws. And don't get me wrong, I'm as Calvinist as any good Baptist ought to be. But this hyper-Calvinism nonsense that's running around in the church today these preachers running from conference to conference, making all these, having, having all these discussions. Nobody's getting saved. We don't give invitations in the church anymore. People are going to get saved. They get saved. They're not going to get saved. So what? Can't do nothing about it anyway. Jesus didn't die for them anyhow. Nonsense. It's a way for preachers to be lazy. And church people to do nothing. And watch the world die and go to hell when Jesus Christ has died for them on the cross. The Word of God teaches plainly three truths. Jesus died for the elect. Jesus died for the world. And Jesus died for every man. The Word of God is plain on that. You say, well, Brother Todd, which is it? It's all three, baby. And just because you and your, and your professor at seminary can't understand the, the, the manifold greatness of God does not limit what Christ did at Calvary. Brother Todd, we all agree with you. Amen. But somebody might be watching on that, on that, on that deal. It's 8 o'clock. It would be my mama that actually kept the word and tried to get out of this sermon before it's time. I was wondering. I was wondering who would be so rebellious or something. And bring it up. I gave you an opportunity. Look what you did. Might as well have been the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I know you were me. I'm, and you know if there's anybody else, I'd let it go. I'm just teasing you. God is our covering. We see the Lord's reason. We see mankind's rebellion. One thing we, you got to understand, guys and gals, is that when we have the Word of God, there is an added responsibility to having the Word of God. Adam had the Word of God and cursed his whole family. When we have the word, so Jesus said, to whom much is given, much more be required of them. You know, what, you know what's amazing? The word of God says that Enoch, after the, after the birth of his son Methuselah, walked with God for 300 years. He's the first man, the Bible says, walked with God since Adam's fall. He didn't have no Bible. Noah went about building an ark for 100 years. Didn't have no Bible. Abraham didn't have no Bible. God moved their heart and they responded. 
How much more do we, we hold God's word in our hand? He personalizes revelation for us and encourages us to move, to minister, to do whatever. And we are, and we have the word of God to back it up. We worry about whether or not God's going to take, take care of us. And we see, we can read the word of God and see that he will meet all of our needs in Christ Jesus. We wonder if we're up to the task. We read in the word of God that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We, we mumble and complain and murmur. We wonder if God loves us. He said, for God's love loved the world. He gave his only begotten. So we got the word of God to encourage us. Apollos was out preaching the word of God he knew. When Priscilla and Aquila came up to him and heard it, and told he but didn't know nothing but the, but the baptism of John, and that's what he was preaching. And they asked him, you heard about Jesus? And when he heard about Jesus, then he went to preaching what God revealed to him. Act on the word of God you got. Act on the word of God you know. Guys, we're responsible. The church is the keeper of the word of God. The world is not going to come to the word. We've got to go declare it to the world. There's hope in the word of God. There's life in the word of God. Amen? But there's responsibility with the Word of God. Adam was kicking around by himself on this planet when the Lord looked at him and said, that tree there, you leave it alone. And Eve came along very quickly thereafter. But it don't say in Eve all die. Now, ladies, the good Lord said, y'all got to put up with that childbearing because of Eve and just standing on this side of the fence. I say, I'm glad it wasn't us. Yeah, some of y'all look pretty miserable about nine months into this thing, but but it but it fell in because Adam directly rebelled against the word of God. Listen to me tonight, and I'm going to close. We'll pick back up on this next week. You're sitting here today, and God's calling your heart, and God is using His word to call you. You understand there's a responsibility with that. How many times have y'all heard me say, the Word of God says this, that if you will receive Him, He will give you the power to be His child. And He does that to everybody who believes on His name. Any of y'all ever heard me say that statement? That's John 1 and 12. Have you ever heard me say, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved? That's the Word of God. Have you ever heard me say, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved? That's the word of God. Right there. How many times you heard me say, unless the Father draws a man, he can't come? How many times you heard me say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? In fact, that was Jesus' sermon he went around preaching. And you say, preacher, I'm not going to repent. And you rebel against the direct command of God. You say, but preacher, what's going to happen? Probably happened the same way it did with Adam. Adam lived over 900 years. I wonder if for 900 years people wasn't walking around going, I thought God said he was going to die. I mean, he looked pretty good for a 700-year-old year old dude, don't y'all think? I mean, he just had his third kid. He's 130. Never looked younger. But guess what? He came. He came. It had his reckoning. Now, I got good hope for old Adam. I got good hope for old Adam because when the Lord came calling in that garden, and he had hid himself, that when God said, Adam, where are you? He said, here I am. He said, why are you, why are you hiding? He said, because I was naked. The Lord looked at him and said, who told you that? You eat of that tree? Yes. God Almighty knew the boy would eat of the tree. God was looking for that moment of honesty with him. When God calls to us, it's that same reality. Where you at? Why wisdom is here I am. What you doing there? I'm guilty. Amen. Adam and Eve had made them robes of, of tree leaves. Little coverings. 
God took them coverings from them and gave them the coverings of skins of animals. Blood. Blood had to be shed to make mankind a covering. And that's what Christ did at Calvary. And let me tell you something. If you're here tonight and you understand what I'm talking about, y'all listen to me now. You're responsible for it. You're responsible for it. You say, Brother Todd, does that mean if I never heard, I'd have been saved? No. Romans is clear. Romans is clear that God wrote the law on mankind's heart. Just wasn't under the direct command of it, like having the word of God or what Adam heard. But there's still guilt because God showed you. But you, you've got more than that going at you now. If God's directly calling you under his word. The Bible says that the visible things clearly show the invisible one. We read it in Romans chapter 1. But nobody gets saved through general revelation. They get saved by specific revelation. God specifically calling you tonight. And you giving a specific answer. Y'all following me? If you're here tonight and you give that answer, praise God. Let's walk in it, grow in it. We'll celebrate more. We'll really start looking at how God has loosed it from, from, this, from the wages of sin. But if you're here tonight and God's calling you to be saved, that's what he's wanting to do in you. In a minute, I'm going to ask everybody to bow their head, close their eyes. I'm going to start leading a prayer. It is a prayer of salvation. For, it is for salvation. If God's calling you to be saved, the prayer is going to convey trust in God, repentance toward God, a willingness to turn from sin, seeking forgiveness from God and a belief that Christ has died for you and raised from, rose from the grave that you might have life. If God, the Spirit of God is saying amen to everything I just said and it's time for you to be saved then you speak to God in your heart while I speak out loud. Bow your heads please. Eyes closed. Let's Hello. I want to thank you for spending this time with us today. I hope there was something that happened during the, the message or maybe during the, some of the singing that you saw that, uh, that spoke to you in some way. You know, one of the great things that happens when we talk about God's Word is God starts talking to us. You know, the Word of God says, in fact, Jesus, the Son of God, said that unless the Father draws someone, they can't come. One of the great things is that the Spirit of God, working in harmony, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he seeks us and he calls us and he draws us to himself. You know, if you're listening to me right now and you are already a Christian, you know this has already happened in your life at one point or another. Maybe now you're, as you listen to the word of God, you're, you're feeling him talk to you. He's probably leading you towards some type of decision. I want to encourage you if God's moving you to, to accept a challenge or... Uh, to take a step of faith, to, to just listen for God and expect that he's going to uh, help you, that he loves you, and that you're one of his children. Sometimes as he talks to us, it's not real comfortable. We have to remember that the Bible tells us that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And sometimes he does speak to us and lets us know there's a problem so that we see his son is the solution and we kind of get back on track. If we can help you with that here at Victory Church, we'd love to. You can contact us uh, uh, through the website, uh, online, some way or another. I'm sure you can find a way. And, um, and we'd love to get to help you uh, uh, grow in your walk. Uh, perhaps, as you listen today, you've never really come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you're experiencing that call for the first time. Uh, the Bible says God's not the author of confusion. So if he's speaking to you, he's, he knows what he's talking about. He's if you heard during the message, there was probably a time where I was talking about coming to faith or, or being saved, as the Bible calls it. It's where God calls us out of the darkness of our sin and the separation that's caused by our sin as we recognize and we come to believe that Jesus died for our sins on the cross. He paid that price. He rose from the grave. He's alive, and he can give us life. And the Bible tells us that when we, when we come to a point of faith in that and we begin to speak to God about it, he enters into our life, he makes us his child, and he begins to make all kinds of, of great and wonderful promises to us. But there's two things that are absolutely essential, and that is that we believe uh, that Christ has died for us, that he's rose from, uh, for us, that he wants a life with us, and that our sin has us separated. You hear two big words when you read the word of God. You hear belief and you hear repentance. We repent of sin means we turn from it. 
and we repent because we believe. We believe that Jesus Christ is our substitute for sin. He died on the cross in our place, and he rose from the grave. The Bible says to give us life. The way that begins to operate in our life is the Word of God says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so the reality is, is that God calls us so that we make a choice towards him. And we show our belief in that choice by believing enough to pray. Real faith always has, uh, it always produces something. It produces a work. In this case, it produces us believing enough to act, to speak towards a God we've never seen. We've never seen with our physical eyes or heard with our physical ears, but yet we know and we believe that he's leading us out of darkness into light, and he's, and he's speaking to us. We, it's, it's, it's the loudest voice we never hear, so to speak. Loudest sound you'll never hear is the call of God into your life. But it's real, and if you understand if uh, the things we talked about today in the message, what I'm talking about right now, if God's calling you, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. You need to come to that point of decision. Um, and the way you do that is to pray. Now, you don't need my help to do it. You can right now just ask the Lord to forgive your sins, tell him that you believe that he died for you on the cross, he rose from the grave, that, that you want to repent of sin, turn from sin, and turn to him. And somewhere in there, the Lord will meet you in that faith, and he will save you. The Bible says for as many as have received him, and those that want to believe on him, the Bible says he, he calls those people his children. In fact, it says he gives them the power to be the children of God. If you say, preacher, I don't really know what to say. In just a second, I'll lead you in a prayer where you could pray and ask Christ to be your Lord and Savior, but I want you to really understand what I'm about to say, and I think you probably know this. You, you don't get saved because you repeat after a preacher. You've got to believe what you say to God. But if you do believe that he died for you, he rose from the grave to give you life, that you want to turn from sin, then just bow your head right there where you are and just say these words out loud while I say them along, but be talking to God. Just say something like this. Just say, Dear Jesus, I know that I'm lost, and I know I can't save myself. But with all my heart, I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the grave, and you can give me life. I ask you to come into my life, to be my Lord. I'll try to follow you, to be my Savior, because I need you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Give me a new life in you that you tell me about in your word and help me to begin to walk with you. And I pray this in Jesus' name and just say amen. And if you're here, if you're listening to me right now and, and deep in your heart you know that you wanted to accept Christ as your Savior as he was calling you and you wanted to turn from sin and have him forgive your sin, then in the simplicity of, of that prayer and in the simplicity of faith, the Word of God says if you received him and believed in him, he gave you that power to be his child. Now, there's things to do. There's a life to live. There's great things that are going to happen in your life, and God wants to lead you through them, and you're going to need some help. If there is a Bible-believing church somewhere around you, and you'll know where that is because they talk more about Jesus than they do anything else, but uh, if, if you don't have a place like that around where you're at or you can get to, you can contact us here at Victory Church. Our web uh, address is victory-church.net, and you found us here on the Internet, so I imagine you can probably find our homepage. Just find us, send us a note. There's a way there to contact us. You can call the church. Uh, if you're where you can get to a call or call into America, it's 972-452-3751. And you can give us a call, and we'll try to help you with the things that you need to do next. I'm so proud for you, so glad for you. If, if, if you can, come back and be with us at the next uh, simulcast, uh, the next podcast that goes out. Remember that uh, all of our, our videoed messages and even a lot of our audio messages or online. Uh, you'll find them archived uh, there in the website. If there's anything we can do for you, we'll try our best to do it. God bless you. We love you. And thanks again for coming by today.